11th with Dr. Tammy Parker. We're going to talk about wounds, which is one of those important topics because when it happens, we're always uh, needing to know what to do really fast. So I hope you could join us again next month. And thanks for being here today. So, Rosemary, I'm just in awe and thrilled that you could be here today. Uh, I think it's super special because you know so much about so many birds and we are just honored and privileged to have you here. So take it away, share your wisdom. And at the end, we'll try to have some conversation. Thank you very much, Anne. And thank you so much for inviting me. I still remember the great time I had when you invited me to speak at your meeting in 2016. And um, so many really- I uh, muted you and took you off video. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so many committed people at that meeting. So um, thanks again. Now I'm going to cover quite a wide range of topics. Um, just to give you a bit of background, the first birds I ever kept and bred were buzzardigars. I still think this is a wonderful and much underappreciated species and more people should learn the ropes with it. Okay, so, um, Let's set the scene with parrots. Now, it's the third largest bird family in the world. Oh, just look here, you can see only tyrant flycatchers have more species. And parrots, actually, there are 400 or 401 species now. And the extraordinary thing about parrots is their great diversity in shape, size, color, um, from the tiny little pygmy parrots to the huge hyacinth macaw. And I'm really laboring the point about diversity in parrots because, um, you know, we tend to embrace so many different species with the word parrot. And really, there's such a lot to learn because they're just so different. Um, and they are quite distinct from any other group of birds. As Erwin Straisman said, almost no other large group of birds is more sharply set apart from all others than the parrots, which form an exclusive order. They have no close relatives. And we do not, how do we do define a parrot? We don't define it by its beak shape as not all parrots, although most do, have hook bills, and some hawks and owls have similar shaped beaks. But we have to go back um, in the midst of time when birds evolved and parrots evolved uh, quite distinctly from other groups of birds. They are one of the most distinct and intriguing groups with, as most of us know, highly expanded brains, highly developed cognitive and vocal communication skills. <clears throat> so if we just look at some of the parts of the neotropics, um, how, how different they are. Unfortunately, I will mention this here, that as in other, any other continent, there are a large number of endangered and even critically endangered parrot species uh, in South America. I mean, a lot of people might not realize that the yellow-naped Amazon, which is so familiar to so many parrot lovers, is now a critically endangered species. And although the hyacinth macaw is currently classified as vulnerable, uh, this is almost certainly going to change to a higher level of threat in the very near future. Um, I'm just making a brief mention of conservation here. Uh, it, it, it is a subject that I'm totally devoted to, and I hope I can give a talk just on this subject at a later date. 
but um, I just want to mention this wonderful lady, Nueva Guedes, because she's devoted her whole life to this bird. And without her, it would be in an even worse position than it is now, just as all her wonderful nest box uh, involvements were producing such good increase in population. There were the terrible fires in the Pantanal. But nevertheless, um, just in the past year, imagine that they monitored 310 nests, uh, just an incredible achievement. So I just wanted to pay my respect to Vate Neva. Okay, um, uh, right, we must never underestimate the extraordinary intellect and intelligence of parrots. I love the description of Alan Bond and Judy Diamond when they said, little green feathered people with a will of their own, clever, manipulative, capricious, rather like leprechauns. Through a fluke of nature, a particularly human intelligence seems to have been transplanted into the body of a bird. And how true that is. And a few quotes from great people here. Edward Lear, the artist and limerick writer, he, he said that on his death, he was sure that his soul would only be comfortable in that of a parrot. <laughs> and then the scientist Tim Lowe, parrots are the most are the birds most like humans, intelligent, talkative, playful, curious, sociable, and open to learning all through their long lives. And that last comment is something that we must not forget. So I often think that we really don't appreciate just how wonderful are these birds that, that we live with. And do we realize how privileged we are to share our lives with these extraordinary creatures? I hope that we never take them for granted. And every power, of course, was evolved to live in a certain habitat. It certainly didn't evolve to live in our house, houses. And we must never forget that many species are only one or two generations away from wild ancestors. We have to make allowances for them. We have to try to understand what they see, what they understand in our homes. And we must never forget that every bird is an individual whose life is very important. It depends on you for everything and on your decisions. Parrots are the most highly sentient creatures. You know, sometimes a parrot might start to pluck itself and the owner has no idea why. And it could be that it is picking up the stress of the owner or some uncomfortable situation in the household. They are so sensitive and we, we must realize that. Uh, here you can see this uh, red-rented cockatoo has started to pluck herself and plucking can be a real problem. But the reason of the birds Picking up stress in the household is one that is often overlooked. Yes, so parrots depend on us for everything and on our decisions. Right, so here I would like to pay a tribute to Chris. She was quoted in Cage and Avery Birds in July, and she was talking about hand-rearing parrots. And every breeder makes a big decision when they take a chick away from its parents. And Chris said, and I really admire her for this, 
the more often I took baby's or eggs, the more uncomfortable I became. The obvious distress shown by the parent cockatoos became more and more agonizing to watch. It finally dawned on me that this was an act that totally disrespected the parent's emotional well-being and was, in my evolving view, abusive to the welfare of parrots. To subject breeding parrots to this, this disruption is ethically wrong and humane. Thank you, Chris, for saying these words that are almost never spoken, but they are so true. It's not just cockatoos. I believe that most parrots suffer in this way when their chicks are stolen from the nest. In fact, these words of Chris inspired me to write an article on the subject of why we should always aim for parent-reared parrots. And this article is just published in the um, February issue of Parrots magazine. So thanks again, Chris, for those very wise words. So, True satisfaction in bird keeping comes from knowing each bird as an individual and giving it what it needs to keep it happy and healthy. This is why I hate big power breeding establishments. You cannot get to know birds as individuals. That is so important. Unfortunately, and I'm sure Susan and any other vet will confirm this. Too many parrots die young. And common causes of early deaths are poor dart and also careless escapes. Their lives are in our hands. We have to be vigilant every moment that we are around them. If you're going to buy a parrot, you must make very careful decisions. Never buy an unweaned young bird. In fact, a responsible breeder would not sell one anyway. And always try to build up a relationship with a breeder before you buy a parrot. When you acquire your birds, there are three things that you should have. Now, a padded catching net, you might say, well, why would I need that? Because my bird is tame, I can pick it up. Believe me, in an emergency, if there was a fire, a gas uh, incident or flood, your bird, if it was loose in your home, it would panic. You would not be able to pick it up. You, you need to have a catching net. The other thing you need is a carbon monoxide alarm because the respiratory system of birds is much more sensitive than that of humans. Fumes can kill them. They can kill them very quickly. This is another thing we must always be aware of. And the third thing that I see as essential is a infrared heat lamp. Um, a sick bird needs focused heat. It doesn't just need to be put near a radiator. So here again, if your bird is ill, it needs heat and it needs hydration. So please do bear that in mind. Often birds that are unwell become more unwell because they're not having enough heat and they are losing body heat very fast. Now again, I'm going to emphasize the diversity of parrots, of, of, of the different habitats that we find them in, from the temperate forests of Chile up to 16,000 feet in the Andes, which seems absolutely incredible. And I know years ago when these gorgeous, tiny little Andean parakeets 
were first trapped and exported. Unfortunately, the um, mortality was very high because they were used to living at very high altitudes. So we have to consider this as well. That they, would, they are adapted to very different lifestyles from uh, Kia in New Zealand to the heat of Africa and here the Senegal parrots, which have wonderful camouflage in this K-pop tree. And to the habitat that we might think of as more usual, um, rainforest. And yet, in our homes and in our aviaries, we do still tend to think of them as parrots and we're not learning enough about the differences and what the different species need. Obviously, they take an enormous range of food sources, from palm fruits that we all know about, even to aquatic plants, which might be as, come as a surprise to some people. And because they have such a, a wide range of food items, of course, they also have quite a wide range of beak shapes. So here you can see slender build conure, for example, which is uh, adapted to feed on the nuts of Araucaria pine, although of course in captivity, it can feed on a much wider variety of foods. And the fantastic palm cockatoo, which has such an extraordinary beak shape, So we have to learn as much as we can about the dietary needs of individual birds and of the various species. For example, as we know uh, with macaws, some of them um, are specialists on feeding on nuts which have a very high fat content. So you could feed them a huge amount of sunflower in the dark, which is high fat, and it's not going to do them any harm, believe me. But then this eclectus, she had been fed on what many people consider to be a typical parrot dark. Sunflower seed and peanuts, of course, we can't think of anything worse because eclectus need soft items and small seeds and they do not need high fat foods. I remember that in one big parrot collection, a new vet who was in charge of the dart took over and the idea was that sunflower should be withdrawn from all parrots. This really were, could have resulted in the deaths of birds like black cockatoos. They absolutely must have high fat seeds like sunflower. So you cannot generalize. You have to learn about the requirements of different species. And we have to work hard sometimes to make their diet more varied. Um, for example, here, uh, these are my conures, put grapes in a peanut holder and they have to work quite hard to get them out. I like all my birds to forage for different items and, and not go to a dish where items are cut up or make it difficult, evoke their curiosity. There are ways to persuade your birds to take a wider, wider variety of foods. For example, often, uh, well, this is in avery birds, but the same can apply with the birds in our homes. A food that is normally ignored um, 
if you throw it on the roof of the cage or aviary, uh, it becomes something much more attractive. For example, here, the catkins from one tree, uh, this is at Laurel Park in Tenery, were always falling on the uh, roof of the lorikeet aviaries, and they would keep them amused for hours. I cannot emphasize too strongly that we need to give our birds more natural foods. Um, right from when I was a young teenager, I was going out picking seeding grasses from my budgies and various other wild foods. I still do it today. I pick them along grass verges on main roads. So often people have said to me, Oh, I wouldn't dare do that. They might be contaminated. It's very unlikely, believe me. Today, we know, we still know comparatively little about the diets of many parrot species. Um, okay, we know that lorries feed on nectar and flowers, um, but they have more unusual habits, such as taking sap from a tree. And there will be other parrot species, not only lorikeets, that are also taking tree sap. So it's very, very important to research what a parrot species eats in the world. I would recommend everyone to get Joseph Forshaw's incredible book, Parrots of the World, because there's so much information in that about what wild parrots are eating. Although it's so old, it, the information is so valuable. Since then, there have been many, many studies on different species of what wild parrots are eating. But the problem is that they're in scientific papers and they're scattered. So either of Joseph Forshaw's books, Parrots of the World or Australian Parrots, will provide you with so much information. And these days, when there are so many invasive species throughout the world, plant species, um, that parrots are eating in their natural habitat might also be found uh, in our own localities. So that's something else to consider. I cannot overemphasize the importance, again, these are my birds, of offering fresh flowers, berries, buds and leaves. You know, these birds are often considered to be seed eaters, but you give them enough of natural items like this, and they're not really that interested in seed. They, they much prefer soft natural items. Of course, they will take a bit of hemp and sunflower, but we can do better than that. Um, you'll find actually a lot of for those of you who keep uh, green sheet conures and other of these wonderful parakeets, there's um, a great deal of information on feeding these birds in the revised edition of this book of mine. <clears throat> we can think of lots of ways to enrich our, the lives of our birds by giving them fresh cut things. Um, you might be able to grow millet sprays or just go out and cut branches from willow trees when they have buds on them or lots of different kinds of trees. You know, we just need to make a tremendous effort to provide more natural foods in a way which allows them to forage. They just love it. 
um, it's so unrewarding for them to be offered dishes with items in them. We've got to keep them busy. Foraging is what they do for hours and hours in the world. And we need to make a much bigger effort to try to copy this. Um, apple blossom, for example, or blossoms from other fruit trees. So many parrots will enjoy this. And even large birds like macaws eat flowers. I think this is something that uh, so many people do not realise. Um, these are Lear's macaws at the um, well-known ACTP uh, breeding facility where the Spix and Lears are bred in Germany. And they really thought about environmental enrichment. And here you can see them foraging in the grass among weeds and uh, growing oats. Well, <clears throat> we can't all do that, but we can plant whole oats in little pots and grow them and make them accessible to our birds in our homes. They really love them. And we also need to consider um, the much elevated vitamin content of sprouted foods um, as an addition to the dry seeds that many parrots receive. If you're worried about the growth of bacteria, which you shouldn't be, you just need to put a, a few drops of grape seed, seed extract in the water when you're soaking the uh, items for sprouting. And that prevents the growth of mold and bacteria. Mm. So you can see from that to that in three days, you've got a product which is so much more valuable, the sprouted mung beans and other pulses. Incidentally, um, if you've got a young parrot, uh, defrosted frozen sweet corn and peas mixed with the sprouted foods or given separately are ideal because young birds need soft foods. I cannot overemphasize this. Um, unfortunately, I think some breeders don't make this clear. They need, young birds need soft food for months after they uh, might be expected to exist on hard seeds or even pellets. So this is a very important aspect. I know that Susan or any other avian vet will tell you about the many health problems that are caused as a result of a deficiency of vitamin A. Um, such as uh, reddish underside of the feet, even loss of voice, aspergillosis, respiratory problems. And a study in the United States found that 67% of pet birds were receiving less than the recommended level of vitamin A, which is quite shock shocking. Here you can see um, pomegranate, which is um, wonderful food if you can get the right kind of fruit that is not grown for juice but is grown actually for the fruit. For grey parrots, uh, they grey parrots especially can be susceptible to um, vitamin A deficiency so if you can get African oil palm fruits they have a, a, a very high vitamin A content. Uh, mango, mango and papaya are other 
of foods that are rich in vitamin A. Now here are some of the more commonly fed carrot, red bell pepper, broccoli, and mango. So we need to really work hard to persuade our birds to take these items. They will, if they're offered in the right way. Our birds also need minerals. So um, even the humble dandelion leaf, which is a marvelous food, contains calcium, manganese, sodium, and iron. And so many parrots um, love them. Pick them when they're young, not when they're bigger and tougher. They also contain calcium, which of course is one of the most important minerals. And I wonder how many people actually feed dried figs to their parrots. Of course, in the wild, many different parrot species do feed on figs. Okay, so the ones available to us are probably the Lurida figs from Turkey. But look what the LA Times said. Figs have as much as a thousand times more calcium than other common foods. And by weight, they actually have more calcium than skim milk. Well, from health food stores, you can buy um, organic figs. Um, they look like that. If you soak them for several hours, they plump up and put them on a fruit holder. Um, I never chop them up and put them in a food dish. Put them in a, on a, a holder so that they actually forage for them. Um, you know, please try it. Figs are such a marvelous food. They have tiny, tiny little seeds inside and parrots, large and small, just love them. Of course, an all seed diet is very low in calcium content. Um, most seed mixtures provide only about 20% of the calcium requirement of an unlaying bird. I know that many people are feeding their birds on pellets, so they don't need to worry about that so much. But unfortunately, there are still people who think they can rely on dry seed as a large part of the diet. And that is going to lead to severe health problems in the long term. Calcium deficiency in parrot chicks is very, very common. It's also disastrous. Look here on the left. This is the skeleton of a grey parrot chick that did not receive enough calcium when its bones were forming, either if it was hand reared or whether it was parent reared. And it's, uh, this photograph was taken by a, a retired British vet, Nigel Harcourt Brown. And especially in grey parrots, he found calcium deficiency in chicks that entered his surgery. So common, he would in fact x-ray every young grey that came in and he was shocked by the amount of birds that were calcium deficient. This means that they had multiple fractures. They would often be deformed for the rest of their lives. There's absolutely no excuse for this. Um, it can lead to misshapen beaks, uh, misshapen spine, and very early death. So, of course, that is what your normal skeleton looks like. So. If you are buying a young grey parrot, please be very aware of this factor. Unfortunately, there are some really bad seed mixtures on the market. 
some of them are just filled with items like hard maize um, that almost no parrots eat and that, or pulses that they can't eat until they have been soaked and sprouted. So do be very careful about the quality of the seed mixture that you buy. In the wild, parrots eat more protein when they are breeding, but many of our parrots relish an occasional meat bone. I'm sure that most of you know that. And it's really good for them for the calcium content. And to strip the bone keeps them busy. They absolutely love it. So don't be shy about giving them a chicken or some other bone. The important thing we have to remember is to keep them busy to offer food in a way that does this um, and not to make it so easy that they can consume all they need in two or three minutes. Another fact that we must never, ever forget and unfortunately many power owners do, is that more gnawing wood is extremely important. Um, this is a natural behavior of any power, and it's so frustrating for a bird in a cage that has got nothing to gnaw. So we must make an effort to provide uh, branches from fruit trees or willow and they just love to strip them and also willow is highly beneficial it's very healthy uh, there's some something in the bark that they really love in the wild of course uh, parrots do a lot of gnawing so we have to make an enormous effort, and I mean enormous, to let our parrots gnaw on natural items. Um, well, uh, bathing, of course, is in, important, but I think most of you don't have your birds in aviaries, but they do love a swinging bath. Now, relating to feeding our parrots, a strict feeding schedule should be adhered to. They have a, such a precise sense of time and they will become anxious if the usual feeding time is missed or late. And feeding times sh should, uh, I mean, I believe all parrots, in our care should be fed at least twice a day, three times if possible, just to break up the monotony of the day. And so that should be early morning and afternoon, um, especially uh, for lorries, three times a day is essential because their metabolism is very rapid. If they are without food for even a short time, they show obvious signs of distress. So you can always tell if a lorry has been kept under circumstances where it has food in front of it only for a short time because when they're fed, they fill their crop to the maximum. There is a, a very interesting article by the late Howard Vaughan in Bird Talk, Talk magazine some years ago. And he described a flock of Red Lord Amazons, 300 Red Lord Amazons in Belize, and how they all came together to meet at midday, and then they would split up into three groups and feed their way back to the evening roosting site. He said, one of the things that amazed me was the accuracy of their internal clocks. 
Even though all three groups took separate flight paths through the jungles, they would all show up at the exact same time over the field of grass where they split up in the morning between 5 and 5.05 5 p.m. They would fly in from completely different directions. The three groups would come together in mid-flight over the field and fly the remaining few miles to their roosting site. So I, I know that many parrot owners are aware of the precise sense of time that parrots have, but others are not, and it's something that we should be aware of. So we have to try to see our own behaviour through the eyes of our parrots. Uh, this is my companion. Um, the photo shows her when she was a baby and when she was compliant. Yeah, I had to hand rear her, unfortunately, um, due to the circumstances at that time. Otherwise, I would not have chosen to have had her in my home. Anyway, when she was young, she would come out of her cage whenever I offered my hand until she was five years old. Then she started refusing to come out. Now she would make the decisions. So her cage is in my kitchen. I therefore open the cage door whenever I'm working at the sink. And when she's ready to come out, she simply flies onto my shoulder. So she might come out twice a day, or she might come out three times a day, but she comes out when she wants to come out. I think this is important. We should not be imposing our will on our birds. Also, we shouldn't invite our birds out when it is obviously when it's feeding or dozing, when you are not in a good mood, when unfamiliar people are in the house, when a door or window is open. And these sentient birds, they know if you're not in a good mood and that can make them nippy. Recently, Ed Cravens wrote in Parrots magazine, something that I thought was so true and worth repeating. As the years tick by, something changes for our feathered companions. New life lessons appear less frequently. Human cuddling reaches a peak and wanes. Food choices drift towards the mundane. He's right, this happens so easily. We need to make an effort to introduce new foods, new toys and new experiences. Parrots need small changes. Small things can amuse them. A new small food container for a single small item, perhaps one that they can unhook and throw down for a bit of fun. Ev went on, if our parrot could speak its mind, it would be telling us, I am no longer satisfied with the way you are keeping me. They are words that we need to consider carefully. Wild birds continue to learn throughout their lives and we must give our birds similar opportunities, but inevitably on a smaller scale. And we also need to keep them in the best possible circumstances. Here are some bad circumstances. A cage higher than its wise. Oh, it's just such a poor space for any parrots. And small cages also cause aggressive behavior. We need to give them as much space as we possibly can. And here's a really bad example. Look, you've got another parrot under here. Stacked cages. What kind of life does that bird have down there? Oh, just consider every tiny aspect of your bird's life. Now look at this, my friend Lars Leperhoff in Switzerland. He considers 
everything that could possibly make his birds happy. Okay, he now only has a pair of lovebirds, but look at this fantastic space he's provided for them. And he just loves watching them because they're so happy in this space. The basics that parrots need, food, flight, friendship, water, freedom from fear and stress, and environmental enrichment. Uh, this is one of my juvenile lorries. So we've got to be forever thinking about how we can enrich their environment and not let things stay the same in their cage or aviary. Also, flight. Too often, small parrots are given small cages and small aviaries, especially the small birds like these conures. They have the most extraordinary flight skills that can only be fully appreciated in the world, or perhaps in your home if you let them fly in a big space. So, Give them space, let them fly, please. Um, well, I doubt that many Phoenix Landing members are wing clipping their birds. But I have to say, I consider this an inhumane practice. Um, Alan Jones, a well-known avian vet in the UK, gave me this photograph. This is what a parrot did to its wing after it had been clipped. The stress of wing clipping. Oh, what are people thinking of when they do that? It's so cruel. The other thing about that parrots need is a companion. Now, parrots are, as we know, highly sociable, and they do need a companion, but they need one that is acquired at the same time. To try to introduce one at a later date is often absolutely disastrous, which is why you have to consider from the outset whether you want one or two parrots. For a parrot, mutual preening is so important um, to reinforce the pair bond, to remove feather sheaths, and as a comfort activity. There are some female dominant species, such as eclectors and ringnecks, that don't like mutual preening, and therefore they don't like you rubbing your head. But for most species, it's really important that the human carer does rub the head of their parents. And I mean the head and not touching on other areas which can act as a sexual stimulus. Of this pair of conures were united after months of separation. And of course, instant mutual pruning occurred to reestablish the pair bond. Uh, that it's so sad when you think about it, for a parrot kept on its own that never knows the comfort of mutual preening. Okay, the other thing that parrots need is freedom from fear. Now this bird was in a stressful situation. It could have been a very big species of bird in the next door aviary, and it was causing it to bite its feathers. So we have to look out for little signs like that. And also remember that our parrots are so sentient that if you are ill or stressed, it can cause your bird to bite its feathers, not necessarily pluck them, but perhaps just to bite some of them off. Another thing that can cause stress, over long nails, 
and also don't wear gloves near your birds. That can make many parrots really aggressive. Now I'm going to just say a few things about aviculture. It started with the wonderful Budrigar, who introduced the bird to Europe in 1840. But unfortunately, aviculture has gone horribly wrong. What breeders have done to this beautiful little bird is to me appalling. Uh, enormous size, deformed outline, rough feather quality, short lifespan, poor flight ability. It's like some of the breeds of dogs that are bred for their flat faces or small ears. It's just cruel. And it's such a shame that bird breeding has also gone in this direction. The Budrigal was the first species to be changed by people chasing money for new mutations. Now, more than a century later, mutation breeding is threatening the future of power aviculture. It has reduced the number of parrot species regularly reared in captivity. Um, there are some species in which it's now very hard to find the pure form. Some species like the ring neck, which has an extraordinary number of mutations, unfortunately attracts the wrong type of parrot keeper. The birds are bred in tiny cages and the rare mutations sell for thousands of dollars. So over the years, there's been shifting center of trade. Um, commercial parrot breeding was most prominent in the USA, starting in the USA in the 1970s and 1990s. There's been a big decline in Europe. And now um, we find the Far East and the Middle East. Unfortunately, a lot of this trade involves wild caught illegally imported birds, including grey parrots. It's absolutely disastrous because it's so hard to stop this. Last year, one visitor to Bangkok was astounded to see hundreds of sun conures for sale alongside budgies, cockatiels, lovebirds, and other color mutations. Also, birds like gray parrots and lorries that were wild caught birds. Um, and it's so difficult to control this illegal trade. So there are some big problems in parrot keeping worldwide at the moment. Uh, we can see how the number of parrot species just in the UK has declined um, from a peak of breeding more than 200 species in the year 2000, and that's declined to just 67 species. And this is mainly because of the interest in mutations. So um, it's worldwide. And it is totally the wrong emphasis because birds are living very poor qualities of life. They are commodities, not living creatures to care about. So if you are a bird keeper who loves their birds, true satisfaction comes from knowing each bird as an individual and giving it what it needs to keep it healthy and happy. And to get to know the species well, the Aris keep, for example, is a species I kept for 49 years and typical lifespan in my Aris keep was 20 to 22 years. So as 
unfortunately, there's no time at the moment to talk about my passion, which is power conservation. But I would like to urge all of you to find ways to raise money to donate to power conservation projects. And above all, strive to inspire the current young generation to work for nature and for conservation. Too many of them just don't look up from their phones and their iPads. So please do in, make it your task to inspire a young person. Okay, so um, power conservation hopefully will be a topic of mine for a further talk. So now I would be pleased to answer some of your questions. Thanks, Rosemary. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Susan Ores and Chris Shank to potentially join us, which sounds like fun, right? <laughs> um, that was fantastic. I'm so glad you focused so much on diet, Rosemary. It's one of my favorite topics and such an important ingredient to the quality of life for parents. Um, and I know you've been all over the world. What, how do you think birds that don't have access in, say in Africa to palm oil, how do like South American birds mostly get their vitamin A, do you think? Um, well, um, there's some of the palm nuts, uh, they uh, have a high vitamin A content. Okay, that sounds great. And your birds are so beautiful. Are those crimson bellied? Connors? Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> Spectacular, aren't they? Oh my gosh. And of the 400 species or so in the world of parrots, how many do you think you've seen in person? 399? No, I mean, there are oh, at least um, 100 parrot species that have not been kept in captivity. And um, I mean, how many have I seen? I, I probably, I don't know. That's a good question. I would guess something like two hundred and fifty. But believe me, um, there are so many that are very, very, very difficult to see in the wild. We had to work really hard to see the uh, blue-throated macaw and the red-fronted macaw in Bolivia. Yeah, but they're easy. They're yeah. easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're big and colorful. A lot of parrots are tiny and green. Yeah. <laughs> so well camouflaged. I mean, look at the pulpit parrotlets. You can mistake one for a leaf. It's true. Oh, <laughs> Even in your home, right? They're hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, somebody wants to know what parrot conservation organizations you recommend to support. Um, yes, well, I'm a big believer in supporting organizations that focus on one species because sometimes the range of um, other organizations, I think it can be a bit too wide. And I want to know to which species my funds are being donated. Um, so for example, uh, there are marvelous organizations in South America, such as Aquasis in Brazil, the grey-breasted parakeets. Then, of course, in uh, Bolivia, you have two organisations focusing just on the conservation of red-fronted uh, and blue-throated macaws. Neva Gwed is marvellous, fantastic organisation uh, for hyacinth macaws. So just research the organisations that have a strong focus on one species. Personally, I'm not too keen on um, supporting some of the big organisations because too much money goes on fundraising 
and on expensive offices. So help out the smaller organisations that are very strongly focused on some of the uh, endangered species. As you know, I write this monthly column for the Lefebvre Corporation on conservation. And you know, I, do, I write the post and they do the, donate the money. So I have a lot of posts, but I have to say, I have a hard time finding smaller organizations that have a donate button. So a lot of times the money has to go through Parrots International, like for NAVA and- or Yeah, the but then um, you, you just need to do a bit of research. For example, in uh, Nicaragua, you've got Paso Pacifico. Um, a lot of their work is focused on the yellow naped Amazon. And that's really important work. And as well as that, they are protecting the environment, protecting turtles. And uh, that is another wonderful organization, Paso Pacifico. Paso Pacifico. Hey, hey Anne. Anne, why don't I hear, you? I hear Susan, but I don't see you. Well, I, it says uh, you can't see me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. That's, She's here. Yay. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, I, I think Rosemary has some good ideas about these different groups and she knows more maybe she could um give you a list yeah we've talked about it off and on yeah yeah, yeah yes, it's just yes. hard it's what? hard but anyway if people are looking for i say that because oh, if people want Susan. to support something <laughs> they can go to my lefebvre blog and see all the different organ you know places that we've done something about by species you know whether it be black palm cockatoos or yeah. you know whatever there's susan can awesome. you see me? I can't see me. <laughs> well, we can but see I, you. <laughs> I'm sitting in I'm sitting in the car because I'm about I'm gonna have to go take my horse driving lesson here in a little bit. But hi. <laughs> hi Hello Susan. Susan. Good to catch up with you. Yes, it, Rosemary, you're just so wonderful. I'm I'm so glad you're doing this today. And I, I think one of the things that people need to take away is all the different fresh fruit foods that you were suggesting. I know years I, I tell people to go out and cut branches. Now, you, you know, you have to look at, you, do, you don't want to do things like wild cherry because uh, mm -hmm. they're toxic or you probably shouldn't do maple, but certainly, you know, like hawthorns and autumn olive that has a berry on it at, at, for oh. a time have a flower but those types of things and people say to me all the time oh do we need to take it in and put it in the oven and my response oh. to that <laughs> oh no <laughs> i know i know people say oh i didn't uh, collect hawthorn branches they might be contaminated with droppings from wild birds the chances of that are almost now I've been doing it all my life and it's so satisfying for me it's and fun, for the yeah. birds hawthorn is one of the, uh, with its berries and its blossom and branches for gnawing there's I'm sure there's lots of it about it's so easy to do it yeah and it gives so much pleasure oh I, I, I know we have we have to be a little um, maybe compassionate about the parrot caretaker because they don't want their bird to get sick. And I think it's just a matter of education. Um, yeah. They simply don't know that. And I have spoken to a vet who years ago used to say, oh, he would never do that. And yes, put it in the oven. <laughs> so oh. that, that education has to change. And oh. hopefully the right duty, you know? Right. Yeah, Chris, you're absolutely right because you see, there there are uh, a number of vets that are really worried about microbes. You know, they're they're everywhere, and we have to beat them back with a stick. And, <laughs> and then, then they group us who realize that animals, including humans, live in this vast sea of microbes. It's just <laughs> part of it, right? So, um, so I also want to add because I'm sitting here in Cleveland and there's snow, um, that, that A, um, people need to understand that you're talking fresh branches. In other words, um, branches on trees that are alive. And oh, yeah. As opposed to dead branches. 
And the other thing that I do is I say, you know, um, trees are actually living in the winter time. <laughs> and, you know, and I have to tell you, people don't really understand that. And I'm sure that there are veterinarians that don't understand that also. So these, these tree branches can be harvested in the winter and the birds love to peel that fresh cambium bark. Yeah. They also prefer perching on a fresh branch while mm. the is still alive because it's softer on their feet. Mm. But not only that, they just love to remove that bark. You, you know, you give them a big branch, it, it could take them all day to destroy it. That's what we want, our parrots working at things. Right, right, right. Because that's what they would be doing in the wild, you know? And that's that's something that that is part of that. And I, I really, I don't know if enough of you out there who's listening to Rosemary, and because I, I have to leave in a few minutes, but but she talked about parrots are marvelous sentient creatures that and, and nobody said oh god you're wrong you're wrong right everybody went i'm sure everybody uh, that we're zooming today all nodded their head or just didn't even think about it but as a veterinarian i have to tell you i would say 10 years ago, and in fact, in some cases still, um, that would have been a, whole, a huge debatable issue. In fact, it probably still is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you all know about the concept of bird brains, <laughs> which is this derogatory comment, which Rosemary has said to all of you, how how knowledgeable they are and how intelligent they are and we're just understanding we're just at the tip of that iceberg of understanding some of that so um you know there was a time as a veterinarian i was told in vet school i've been around a long time though really a long time but but back in the day um birds didn't feel pain no. Oh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I was that. long enough for that one. <laughs> so have you, Chris. <laughs> you know, like, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Yes, they they didn't know. They didn't understand all that. So when you said you put that word sentient creature out there, and I was like, wow, that's, I remember when that would have been, I would have been laughed off the stage at AAV if I had said that. I said it anyway, probably. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> yeah, but well, because, you know, I was a neuro person and I I could argue the neuro aspects to it, but um, yeah, it's, it's just one, it's wonderful stuff you've given us today, Rosemary, always wonderful stuff. I love it. And we're going to take her up on that conservation talk later on, too. But I'm, we are. I'm glad she focused on the companion parrot so much today. That was so helpful. And let me emphasize uh, what Rosemary said about becoming complacent with our birds as they get older. And, you know, things become pretty routine and they're given the same toys because they're old and they won't, you know, maybe won't be able to adapt. It may be a little harder for them. And that's not true at all because they're <laughs> constantly learning throughout their lives and you can train a 50 year old parrot if you want um, they have the cognitive abilities to do so and uh, the motivation if you're using positive reinforcement training and such so you know the, um, they're like like me as i get older i like to think i'm still learning <laughs> so, yeah so, so, yeah, so don't take them for granted, I guess, is what I'm saying. And they can also still find friends. Uh, we talked about companionship. Even if you don't get them together, we've very successfully rehomed birds that become friendly companions to the other birds in the household. So ah, that's interesting. don't give up on that. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I appreciated that Rosemary uh, referenced your 
take on breeding too, Chris, which you talked about in your talk a couple of months ago. And I hope that the world is changing in that regard. Do you, th do you guys think so? What do you see in England or Great Britain, Rosemary? Are things changing in that regard? Less, we know, don't actually, We don't actually have many parrot breeders in the UK now. Interesting. Um, uh, the, the, the larger parrots are not saleable. Nobody wants them. They want conures and small birds like that. Sure. Less cockatoos, hopefully. I mean, uh, not. Yeah. Yes, less cockatoos because one of the reasons um, people, the gardens are so small now, they don't have, fortunately, space to breed cockatoos. So um, it's difficult for me to say whether the, there are more or fewer hand reared because there are so few cockatoos bred now. But where hand rearing is concerned, um, I think that there are probably fewer than in the past. Are there rules there and in Europe about breeding? Yes, there are. In some countries, um, like the Netherlands, um, it is actually illegal to uh, take chicks for hand rearing. Um, but there's nothing like that in the UK. I mean, I worry about the cockatoos in the wild. They're certainly threatened, but they're so hard to rehome in captivity. We always have at least 40 or more waiting. Wow. I know we have one right now that's been waiting 12 years that we haven't been able to help. You know, it's just really hard to find homes for yeah, them. Yeah, well, you know, on my website, I give a plea please don't breed white cockatoos. But unfortunately, while birds like Moluccans are fetching big prices, there are always going to be some people breeding them, of which I, I find that so sad because we know these birds are not going to have good lives, that they're going to have countless homes. Right. Yeah. So Susan, do you have your... Um finger in the breeding world at all? Do you know what's going on as far um, as? I don't, I, I've not been in the breeding world for, um, because the people basically in our area um, are not um, breeding. Um, I can tell that there's still a certain amount of it in Florida because they send people unweaned babies um, or they send babies for someone to finish the hand rearing. Um, okay. There's an occasional person that um, has some cockatiels that they're breeding some oftentimes by mistake <laughs> um, or some budgies by mistake. Um, but not any one big. We we see the pet store birds, and like Rosemary indicated, there's at a pet store they're definitely um, only selling small birds, um, and unfortunately the fancy ones, quote unquote, or I, there's some other words they use too, but they're the um, the mutations, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is you know, kind of sad uh, from realistically um, for, for these guys, it's, it's a tough thing. Um, so mostly uh, Pyrura conures um, from a small bird, sometimes a sun conure or a jende, less of the African species. So not, oh, maybe four or five years ago, at an, I believe it was an AFA uh, convention here in Portland. There was a veterinarian, I may be wrong about that, but I know there was a veterinarian who, uh, from Florida, who was pleading her case about, we need more breeding. <laughs> oh. Yeah, we need more people to breed parrots. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess her estimation, um, the amount of people doing that was, dwindling so but again that was five years ago I don't yeah. know yeah and and there was um 
some some can well let's just say um if you're an avian veterinarian you're going to basically put yourself out of business <laughs> well that's true <laughs> i thought of that yeah <laughs> I mean, you, you could you could go by it that way, or you could say, well, um, you know, there's always going to be some some birds around. Um, so, uh, you know, there is that concern that that there aren't. Uh, there's very few bird breeders, but but the types of bird breeders are going to be are probably small birds, which is really appropriate if the, if you're going to breed them. I don't like that idea, but um, and maybe because I'm at the end of my career, so to speak, it won't matter if 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 we end up with very few birds in captivity. That's but really. Uh, I, mean, I guess the question is, how long do they live, Rosemary? There was always that. Um, talk of that bird that blue and gold charlie was supposedly 114 oh, belongs please, to uh, don't believe Churchill. Me. is that true is that bird still in surrey or wherever it was no it was never true it was never it's true. just a press ridiculous stories we know <laughs> that by the time the large macaws are 60 well susan will tell you this they have arthritis and uh, and of course, uh, they can't see very well. They've got cataracts. If a, a macaw or any other parrot lived beyond 70, it would be, to me, extraordinary. Do you but have uh, um, any good information about lifespan? That's always a hard thing to find, you know, decent information, other than that zoo study that came out a few years ago. Yeah, well, there, there is no good in, uh, information for the simple reason that few people keep one power long enough. Yeah, that's hard. I know last time I was in Peru, uh, Don Brightsmith said to us that he was shocked at how uh, early the macaws were dying sooner than he, younger than he thought they would because they were the only time they really ever had trouble was with, or were aggressive or were fighting was over a nest or a mate, and then they would fight to the death. And so we talked actually about comparing captive birds and wild birds and when and why they die. So I know we keep really as, as much information as we can about every bird in our substantial database, but it's always, I'm always curious if anybody has better information we know birds die young a lot of times because they're not well cared for, but if they are cared for, that's the question I always have. Yeah, well, but as I say, they're rare, one bird is rarely with one person or one family long enough. And a lot of the time, it, it's just um, a myth about that bird when it could have been a different bird and it was replaced. You know, you... you these tales of parrots living over 70 are, are, are to me, they're not believable. Susan, and, and, uh, didn't you know a bird at Amazon that was fairly old at one point? I, I have a really old one. <laughs> but but I do have, um, there, there was a fella that, has, that had an Amazon. Um, and now off the top of my head, I, I can see the man's face. I can see the bird. And um, he and I think I'm I'm kind of paraphrasing what Rosemary said. Um, he he died at about a hundred years old, and he bought the bird. Well, it wasn't that he bought the bird; he won the bird in a poker match when he was like fourteen years old. So um, he had that bird about 80 something years so it's, it's a little bit higher than maybe maybe you could go beyond that and depending on the age of the bird when it started so it would be closer to 90 um and like Rosemary says that there was a study a long time ago usually amazons are going to get cataracts after about the age of 100 um and they, they find that macaws so you know i'll just say this quickly and then i probably should go off but um uh, 
Kevin, Dr. Kevin Flammer and I, uh, and a lot of the veterinarians, we, we thought that what we should do is breed birds in captivity because they would live a lot longer because we, we wouldn't have that problem of the wild and the, what happens with birds in the wild. But, but we were wrong. We were horribly wrong. And um, they, they live shorter lives because they're magnificent beings that need to fly. I mean, that's why I was so excited about when Chris did her talk and we talked about birds flying, that they're just designed to fly. And, and then when they become couch potatoes, that contributes to their metabolism, their heart, their lungs, you know, all of their organs and also their joints. And so then when we give them a marginal diet and they sit around, it's a disaster. And so they, they live much shorter. So clinically speaking, by the time um, a bird is somewhere between 15 and 20, we have to start looking at uh, geriatric issues. And, and we need to make sure that that bird is as healthy can possibly be, you know, what, what, what Rose is talking about, doing the right things for them. We've picked up a lot of birds who are in their 40s, you know, that can be documented to their 40s yeah. and 50s. My macaws are all in their thir high 30s, probably at least. So have a different lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't mean that they can't live that age till that age, but but we have to, as veterinarians, start, uh-oh. Let's let's re-examine and make sure this bird is healthy, and and we need to think about things that birds get become geriatric because it's much more subtle than it would be for from a dog and cat perspective. Just like people, they might need their arthritis medicine or their heart medicine. Or, oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. So, yeah. I, I, Rosemary, I love you. Chris Shank, I love you. I, I got to try to walk through the ice to get over to the barn. Be careful. Okay. Thanks yeah. for joining us. Thank yeah. you, Susan. Lovely to see you again. Oh, lovely to see you and keep it up. You're, you're so fabulous. Very important person in the world for parrots. Amen. <laughs> Rosemary, somebody had a question about uh, if parrots sense uh, time changes or seasonal changes and how you think that affects them or anything we should do about that. What's your experience? You know, as the days get longer and shorter, how that affects their... Uh, well, I think it, it probably depends on which part of the world they come from. I mean, if they're from the equator where they're used to a a 12 hour uh, light period, um, you know, parrots, we're talking about different species. Again, we can't generalize. Agreed. Um, I think I remember it was cockatiels, especially who seem, when they get into their kind of heavy egg laying mode, it's very important for them to be 12 on, 12 off kind of thing. Does that sound right? Chris, well, you, uh, you... I, oh, I don't, I don't know about cockatiels. Uh, I do know with my cockatoos who live outside, so I pretty much don't have control of the light situation. Um, around the beginning of December, November, December, when the rains start, um, they are anticipating their breeding season is on its way and right now as I speak it's revving up <laughs> and we are you know only in uh at the very end of January uh, so yeah. <laughs> um yeah and these are birds from Australia I don't have any from the equator but I think the well, rain I I think the rain's influence. What do you think, Rosemary? It def definitely the rain influences them. But the other aspect we have to consider um, is um, 
many of the birds we have, they're only one or two generations away from wild caught birds. Therefore, the instinct to breed at a certain time of the year has not been bred out of them. For example, a lot of my lawyers, or, well, I say my, my lawyers often want to breed in November, but that's uh, nothing to do with the hours of daylight. It's because that would be their natural breeding season. So you said the, um, the motivation to breed has not been bred out of them, whatever. Uh, what do you mean by that? And how, how would that be possible? Or is it possible? Well, what I mean is if we're looking at the budrigar, it's been bred in captivity for so many countless generations that budrigars will breed at any time of the year. <laughs> okay. But certain, but Amazons, for example, have a, a more specific breeding season and that they, most of them have not been bred for enough generations for that desire to breed at a certain time of year to have been bred out of them. Huh. Do you think living in a house where we turn on the heat in the winter is confusing to them because it seems like, you know, warm spring? I've often I, wondered if that made I, a difference. I, I don't think so. Well, I think there's so many factors that we yeah. can't. There's so many factors here. Mm -hmm. So there was a good question from Elizabeth Wilson that can kind of follow up on this um, seasonal breeding. Um, and if you want to address that. Um, uh, if you know what it is, go for okay. it. Okay. Well, she said, um, She's interested in your take on the companion parrot. You mentioned your conure, this is to you, Rosemary, who will come to your shoulder in the kitchen. I work actively to avoid the pair bond. Now there is a huge, um, this is my me talking now. <laughs> That's a huge- Who knows, Elizabeth, yeah. yeah. This is a huge stimulation for breeding. So, okay, that aside, but it, uh, but in some ways, it seems inevitable when you consider all the Fs like friendship you talked about. So head preening only. But, you know, if we spend a lot of time together, sometimes on the shoulder. And um, if human interaction is limited to training only or stationing all the time, it seems boring for a parrot kept in the home. So I thought that was a really interesting question because so much and I'll let you answer in a second, Rosemary, sorry. So much of what we do with our parrots in the home can be a stimulus for this bonding and uh, leads us down the road of... of yeah, but, uh, but par parrots are highly social creatures. If, mm -hmm. we, if we keep one on its own, that is cruel. We have to try to give it as much companionship as possible. And you can do that in an intelligent way. My Conya has never shown any sexual bonding behavior. She just wants attention and companionship. Mm -hmm. And we've got to give that to them. We've deprived them of a mate of their own species. Right, so I would say to Elizabeth that if your bird is spending lots of time on your shoulder and you see no ill effects, then that's great. You know, that's wonderful. Well, actually she doesn't spend a lot of time on my shoulder. She flies to my shoulder to tell me she wants to come out. Then I'll take her into another room. And well, uh, yeah. yeah, well, I was I, saying that Elizabeth's bird stays on her shoulder a lot. Yeah. And I'm saying that if, if everything's copacetic, then fine. And, and your Conyer, has chooses to do what she wants to do and that's and not be with you 24 hours a day and that's super you know so it sounds like elizabeth is paying attention to pair bonding things yes. and avoiding those so yes. that's good so so there's a friendship there without mating overtures and, and training um learning you know tricks if you want to call them tricks behaviors that's hugely important to our parrots because you're you're focusing one-on-one -on -one to that parrot and watching his or her behavior and body language and and having fun together and, and that's not to be dismissed or um 
think it's it's something that's not as important as physical contact. You know, we primates love touching things. <laughs> and of course, parrots love to be touched, although some species don't. I, I also find that training gets my guys really excited. So, you know, don't mentally be stimulating. Yeah. Rosemary, somebody wants to know, you know, you showed that slide with the radiograph of the uh, Africa gray with the severe calcium deficiency. And somebody wants to know if baby birds that have calcium deficiencies can they get better with a better diet and have a longer life or are they kind of doomed to die young? You'd have to treat, well, uh, um, Susan would have been the person to ask. You'd have to treat a calcium deficiency very, very early. I mean, bef before like two months, if they can't get better otherwise. They will have those fractures and other deformities, deformed beaks, deformed feet throughout their lives. It doesn't matter how much calcium you give them once those young bones are formed um you're not going to alter that that's why it's such a scandal that so many breeders do not pay attention to this they are selling deformed birds mm -hmm. right yeah it's a problem everywhere and it sounds like the middle east is where it's all happening now Oh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's heartbreaking what is happening there, absolutely heartbreaking, because the trade is driving different species to extinction, and that they are, they are not just words. This right. is what is happening. Especially the African species, African greys. Yeah. yeah. They're ever so popular. Um, uh, especially birds like lorries, that some are found only on one small island. Already two species of lorries have been trapped to extinction. Uh, anyway, I won't uh, elaborate more now, but I hope at a future um, uh, meeting I can tell you more about that. You know, we we talk about the Moluccan cockatoo being in danger, and Stuart Metz did such a great job of bringing that to our attention in Indonesia. But that's where the umbrella cockatoos are from, also, and we don't hear much about them. And they're such a common pet in many parts of the world, but. We don't know a lot about their natural wild behaviors. Do you, Rosemary? Do you have any good sources for that? No, there, I don't think there are any. We only know that they're still being trapped out of the wild. Right. You know, Stuart Metz was great. At, um, I have lots of data and samples from him about what the Moluccan cockatoos were yes, eating in the wild. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> there's I have great resources from him that I, I think need to go into some Smithsonian of parrots. But... Um, but there's but not I don't know equivalent. anything about the umbrellas. And no, I... There's not the equivalent for many other Indonesian species. So little is known. Nobody is studying in them in the wild. All we know is that, that some are being trapped in horrendous numbers. Yeah. I wish they were all female. We could find homes so much faster. <laughs> then they grow up and they become boys. <laughs> and Chris knows this, those boy cockatoos. They give us a a real challenge yeah yes they do <laughs> they're okay, just being themselves but yeah yeah perhaps one more question Anne. if you yes want. say again you have one more question oh somebody wants to know if you know elaine henley she is the one that does the tour to uganda that we we did a couple of years ago. Yeah, yes. In my book, Parrot Conservation, I use one of her photographs and information from her about the gray parrot. Yeah. We're working, for those of you with African species, we're working with uh, Rowan Martin, hopefully, to do another tour to Africa in the upcoming years. Um, there's just such, there's a lot of chaos in Africa and... Um, so it's hard to organize something, but so many people have African species. And I think for those of us who have been to see birds in the wild, we know how it changes how we think about them and how we want to provide for them in our homes much better than we already do. So if you haven't been to see birds in the wild, I encourage you to do yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. You cannot have an appreciation of what your parrot needs, unless you've seen parrots in the wild, you, you have to do that. It's so important. 
This is a green wing from Brazil. <laughs> Keeps me centered in my life with green wings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And well, well thank, thank you, you, Rosemary. Thank and you Chris, so I'm much. so glad you could join today too. Oh, it's an honor. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's an it, it's also it's a privilege to speak with both of you. And I've really enjoyed it. And thank you so much for the invitation. Oh. And I'm, I'm definitely on for the conservation tool. Great. We'll work <laughs> out a date and hopefully everybody and more will come back for that. Because if you live with a parrot, you need to care about the wild parrots because there's too many things in trouble on the planet. So we parrot people have to care about parrots. So go sign a petition, go give $5, just do something to help everybody. So. Well, Rosemary, you are you are the hero of all heroes, and we are so lucky to have you on the planet caring about parrots because you've done more for the parrot world, I think, than almost everybody combined. And we're just so grateful to be your friend and to know you and to have you as our guest today. So thank you. Thank you, thank Rosemary. You, Anne. Thank All right, everybody, don't forget next month, we're going to talk about wounds because those do happen and what to do about it with Dr. Tammy Parker, one of the veterinarians we work with from South Carolina, South Carolina, and she's fabulous. So I hope you could join us again on, I think it's February 11th. Oh, and Rosemary, you were talking a lot about wild parrot diets. Just so everybody knows in March, Jose is going to be our speaker to talk about what birds eat in the wild. And he's just done so much in South America that, um, and he's just so articulate and a great guy. So I hope you'll come back. Definitely. Well. I, I'm, I'm a great admirer of what Jose has done. And I look forward to hearing him speak, especially great. on that, on that topic. It's, it's um, a subject that we need to hear a lot more about. He's done a lot of great real scientific work, but he knows how to discuss it in a way that everybody can understand and appreciate. Even though he's from Spain, um, he, his English is a second language. He's super articulate and very well-spoken. So I think you'll enjoy his talk, so. I will, definitely. And Rosemary agreed we could record this, everybody. Thank you for that, Rosemary. Yeah, I got to work on those technical issues, but it'll be up on our website later today. And I'm okay. sorry that I forgot to turn off my audio when I was talking to somebody at the very beginning and I was talking over you. I apologize. So anyway, thanks Good again, work. everybody. Yeah. Bye, okay. everyone. Thank okay, bye. you. See you next bye. month. Bye. Bye.